This is the second Sunday after Pentecost, and our gospel lesson is the gospel according to St. Mark, beginning at the second chapter, 23rd verse, going through the third chapter, 26th verse. So may we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the early 1900s, people began to be increasingly concerned about the, what was in the mattresses that we were buying in these newfangled department stores. Department stores were a new thing. Well, mattress makers would put all kinds of stuff into the mattresses, anything from corn husks to the remains of old hospital sheets. You name it. Did you really want to be sleeping on top of somebody's old hospital sheets? So to keep the public safe, laws were passed that mattresses had to have a label that would say whether the mattress was made of all new materials or maybe recycled materials. Each tag had a bold statement this tag not to be removed under penalty of law. Many people who shop for mattresses did not know this whole history. So if you remove the tag to make yourself just a little bit more comfortable and make the mattress appear just, you know, a little bit better, you lived in fear of the dreaded mattress police who would put you in jail for removing the mattress tag. Now, these tags spawn thousands of jokes. Jay Leno joked that his mother was so law-abiding that she checked her mattress tags once a month. Movies were made that had scenes of prisons where prison tag removers were doing hard time. In the 1990s, after all this, the law was changed so that the tag would now read not to be removed under penalty of law except by the consumer. And people stopped to live in fear of the mattress police. We're all basically law-abiding people. We want to obey the law. We think the law is good. But sometimes we don't understand the function of the law, and we start enforcing the law for the sake of the law. Don't remove the mattress tag rather than understanding that the tag is there to tell us what's inside the mattress. So we can turn the law into an idol. This is what happens in our gospel lesson. More on that in a minute. The mattress tag discussion is just a bit of silliness. You know, just something to get us thinking about how legalistic we can all be. But over-reliance on rules, legalism, can have real consequences in the church. But let me share with you another story about shoes, believe it or not. Now, when I was a kid, my mother took me to Sunday school every week. And I enjoyed Sunday school, and I looked forward to it. Now, those were the days, and you're going to find this hard to believe, those were the days when kid had, kids had play clothes that they wore outside after school, and we also had a special set of clothes for school and for church. Yeah, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Seems like a long time ago. Well, in those olden days, sneakers were worn in only two places, in gym class and after school. When I was in fourth grade, my feet had been growing, and my mother had not had the time, or well, for that matter, at that point, the money, to go get me a new set of shoes. So one fine morning, my mother sent me off to Sunday school wearing sneakers because we planned to go shoe shopping after church. After all, my mom said to me, one Sunday of wearing sneakers won't hurt anyone. Well, after Sunday school ended, my Sunday school teacher pulled me aside to tell me what a horrible little boy I was for wearing sneakers to Sunday school and how horrible my parents must have been to have sent me to Sunday school wearing sneakers. She told me to tell my mother that I must never again wear sneakers to Sunday school. That was 40 years ago. And I have never forgotten the anger and the shame. Now, I'm sure that that Sunday school teacher thought 
that she was upholding the rules and she was protecting God's honor. But she forgot something. She forgot about God's love. Love of God for all children and love of the children that she was teaching. She didn't teach a God of love. She taught a God of rules. So I went back and I told my mother that I never wanted to go to Sunday school or church again. But my mother was a very faithful Christian. She told me that God loved me. She wiped my tears. And she explained that God is loving and perfect even when people are not. I share these two stories about legalism. I could probably tell you about a hundred more so that we can understand what's going on in today's gospel lesson. Now, it's easy to read today's gospel lesson and think, oh, those terrible Pharisees, what awful people they were. I would never have reacted like they did. I would have immediately followed Jesus. We fool ourselves if we think the Pharisees are uniquely evil or law-centered. The truth is they're pretty much people like us. People who love the law. People who think that the law protects God. As though God needs our protection. So on the Sabbath, that's Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, the disciples were walking through a grain field, probably on a Saturday morning, and they're plucking grain. Now the issue is not that they're plucking grain. The grain fields were set aside so that the edges were something where travelers could come and they could take grain. So, perfectly okay that they're plucking grain. But they're doing it on the Sabbath when no work is to be done. I can hear the Pharisees now. The law says no working on the Sabbath. You should have planned ahead. You should have plucked some grain yesterday. Your failure to plan a meal for the Sabbath does not constitute an emergency on God's part. So Jesus goes on and teaches that the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. The rules are in place to help us serve God. We worship God. We do not worship the rules. Well, later at a synagogue, Jesus cures a man with a withered hand. I can hear the Pharisees now. This man has survived this many years with a withered hand. What would it hurt to wait until sundown to cure him? You could wait till tomorrow, but you don't have to. Just wait for sundown. It's only a few hours away. But Jesus does not wait to do good. Jesus does not do healings on a timeline, but as soon as possible. There's a parallel story, by the way, in Luke 13 of a woman's who has been crippled so that she could not stand upright. And Jesus heals her on the Sabbath. Jesus tells the synagogue leader who opposed that healing on the Sabbath, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Now we can stand around all day and we can trash talk the Pharisees and the Herodians. Or we can remove the stick from our own eye. From today's lesson, we can learn to try not to be the Pharisees, not to be the legalists, not to be defined by the legalists. I had a pastor whom I loved when I was a kid, and he had one legalism that I could never figure out. If a woman was getting married for the second time, he would not let her wear a white dress. It's an older practice, but one that's not particularly required by the worship teachings in my church. But that was his rule for second weddings. And he applied it with glee. Glee that I could never understand. And I've always wondered, how many people were hurt by that rule? 
How many people thought that the church was unloving and judgmental? And so I, I ask you, I ask myself, what rules are we enforcing without even realizing it? How are we protecting God as though God needs protection? And then I ask, how have we been hurt by the rules? What do we need to be freed from? Our God is a God of love and mercy and grace and not rules. Now, rules have a place. Where would we be if people ignored green and red lights any more than they already do? Or if people ignored stop signs? The world would be a very dangerous place. Rules have a purpose, but rules serve God. Rules do not define God. Congregations have struggled with children with Down syndrome who can't pass the test for confirmation. And the rule is you have to pass that test. Most congregations have come down on the side of grace, but not all. Some congregations won't let children with Down syndrome be confirmed because they haven't earned the right. As though there's something to be earned here. Congregations continue to struggle with kids who wear sneakers to church. Especially if they're worship assistants. Now some are just glad that the kids show up in any footwear. Some churches actually help less fortunate kids to buy shoes because they think having shoes is important both inside church and, and outside of church. We can apply grace. We can apply law. It used to be that women would not be admitted to church if they weren't wearing a hat. Yeah, I bet most of you don't remember those days and far away. You can still find web discussions on the subject, and I suspect that there are churches where that's Still an issue. Now, the rules are there to help us. I like stop signs. I like traffic lights. They, they help me feel safe. But if your wife is having a baby, feel free to go through the red light. After you stop, it's even a legal doctrine to support the fact that necessity is more important than blind obedience to the law. Our God is the God of love and mercy, and hope, and forgiveness. We don't get to heaven by obeying the rules. We get to heaven by following Jesus. We're about to go up for Holy Communion. We freely share the bread and the cup with all baptized Christians. It is the ultimate reminder that God feeds all of us without regard to rules. If you're not baptized, let's talk. Not because of a rule, but because Jesus invites you to follow. The Sabbath is made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. All rules are made for humankind, not humankind for the rules. So let's not confuse our rules, which we probably like a lot, with God's loving call. And if you have been hurt by the rules, hear that those rules can never separate us from the love of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.